Hello everybody and welcome. Sordix, soon to be Maximum Entertainment, just published a report for the first quarter of 2023. And standing beside me, I have CEO Christina Seely. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Hmm? Uh, you uh, prepared a presentation for today. I so, did. Hmm? So I'll leave you to it and uh, come back to ask some questions. Great, great. Well, thanks for having us. Welcome to our Q1 earnings report. And uh, I'm Christina Seely. I am the CEO of Zordix, soon to be Maximum Entertainment. And with me today is Thierry Bonifoy, CFO, who will be coming and talking a little bit later more about the details around the financials. But let's introduce who we are today. We talked about Zordix becoming Maximum Entertainment. That is happening in the, in the coming weeks officially. Um, but who is Maximum Entertainment and why are we here and what are we talking about? So we are delivering magic to the gamer and everyone. And we aim to be the global leader in indie to double A video game creation, development, publishing, and the entire life cycle of video game. But not only that, we want to expand the universe of video games beyond the traditional video game channel uh, through transmedia as well. And so why do we think we can do this? Because we are a fully integrated entertainment company with a really solid uh, infrastructure for launching games worldwide. So let's get into it of how we got here. Uh, Zordex came into 2021 as a small game studio. Uh, 10 million second revenue, only 68 employees, and fewer than 10 games. But by the end of 2022, we had become 1.1 billion in revenue. We have 240 employees now, and we have over 300 titles in our catalog. So it's been quite a journey in a very short amount of time. But as we are maximum entertainment now and we look to the future, what we're, what we're talking about today is that we have a global unified roadmap. And by 2025, we're looking to have our own IP represent 30% of our total revenue. And the reason we believe we can reach that goal is because we have integrated the company into two divisions. We have one side that's our publishing labels and then we have the other side that's the studios. And as you could tell with this short turnaround of 2021 to 2022 where we became we went from a very small studio to a very, um, you know, a much bigger company. That was due to a lot of acquisitions. There was actually seven acquisitions over the, por over the course of a couple years. And so uh, what we did in 2022 was integrate those studios into one organized group. And they're based all over the world. But they are working on our own IP that we are going to be launching through our publishing labels. And our publishing labels also publish games globally, and that's just for games, which is uh, focusing more on casual games, casual video games, Merge with triple I, triple, very high quality indie titles, Modus, which is focusing on live service and double A titles, and Maximum Games, which is focused on sub-publishing and manages the, the global infrastructure of physical publishing as well. We're located all over the world. So we have studios in Sweden, in Hungary, in Romania, in Brazil, in the US, and then we have publishing labels in the UK, France, and in the US. So we really are um, globally situated to launch video games worldwide. So what did we do in Q1? 183 million SEC, uh, 2.1 million SEC EBITDA, 29% gross margin, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Our EBITDA margin was 1.1%, so basically a little better than break even. And we have 239 employees now. The important um, KPI that uh, we're going to be talking about today are, is revenue from our own IP. As I said earlier, we're really looking to grow our own IP to 30% of our total revenue. And we believe that we're going to do that by 2025, which will be really fast growth from where we are today. So in Q1, only 7% of our revenue came from our own IP. And that's up from where it was in 2022, where, where it was less than 5%. Also, the reason why we're looking at doing that is because our own IP is going to increase our margin and our gross margin percentage already went up in Q1 to 29%. And that is really because of the beginning of our story of our own IP and the margin that brings to the company. 
So let's talk about some things that happened in Q1. Biggest news was that we secured 30 million US dollars in financing, and that's going to fund uh, future acquisitions and future investment into games. Uh, we also relaunched the company as Maximum Entertainment, and we announced our future-looking roadmap. And so that uh, you can check out all of the titles that are on our roadmap uh, when uh, after this report. We also concluded the acquisition of Fun Labs in Romania, and that has become Modus Studios Romania now, and they are actively working on IP that the group will publish. We also released uh, season seven of our very successful live service battle royale called Super Animal Royale, and our own IP, Small Land Survive the Wilds, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. After the quarter, there were some significant um, events that happened as well. Um, myself, the chairman of the board, and some institutional investors acquired a significant position within the company. Um, I increased my position as well as uh, institutional investors coming in, which really creates a nice stable foundation for the company moving forward and shows that we believe in what we're doing. And Maximum Entertainment, we also launched After Image. We also released another own IP, Bramble the Mountain King, to critical and commercial success. And we have two earnouts that got done. Uh, and Small Land, Survive the Wilds, reached 200,000 units sold in early access. And this is just in a very short amount of time over the past month. We talked a little bit about Super Animal Royale. We launched season seven. We had nine million players, and we hope by the time I do this earnings report for Q2, we will have hit that 10 million number in Q2. Also, Small Land, I said we'd talk a little bit more about that. We had over 380,000 wish lists at release, and it has 85% very positive reviews. As an early access game, this is a phenomenal result, and we are really excited about the future of this game. We are really happy to announce that over 200,000 units have sold of this game just in early access. That's on one platform only. Uh, we had 12,000 peak concurrent players, so and many, many, many millions of hours of gameplay watched on Twitch. Uh, as I mentioned, we secured a senior credit facility of $30 million US, and that is 36 months non-amortizing debt, um, and this is really to uh, infuse our uh, acquisition story of additional IP, as well as um, acquiring other studios and other IP to help reach the goal of 30% of our revenue coming from our own IP by 2025. Part of that a uh, step towards those goals was that acquisition of Fun Labs that I just talked about, and they are actively working on uh, multiple games for the group to publish. I'm going to turn it over to Thierry Bonifois now to talk a little bit about the numbers. Thank you, Christina. So the numbers for the Q1. So Q1 is usually a soft quarter uh, in our industry. There's a lot of seasonality. And this year is uh, no different than prior year, except uh, 2022, where we had a very strong catalog sales coming from blockbusters we sold uh, in Q4 of 2021. This quarter, uh, 2023, first quarter 2023, is, I would say, more than normal. So we reach 183 million sec revenue a decrease of 22% compared to 2022 for the reason I just mentioned. What is uh, interesting to see is that uh, it was impacted also because we had no uh, major release, uh, only small land. Small land was uh, released at the end, the very end of the quarter, so impacted only three days of sales. So most of the impact will be in Q2. A positive uh, thing that is, um, coming from more on IP, as uh, Christina just mentioned, is that our gross margin percentage, which is a key metric in our industry, increased uh, to 29% uh, from uh, 27 uh, last year. And uh, that is going to be a metric that is very important to monitor in the, in the future. Due to the uh, small uh, quarter or soft quarter, uh, of course, the EBDA 
is uh, lower uh, with just about uh, break-even or slightly above break-even. A few words about the balance sheet. The balance sheet is basically the, uh, a reflection of our strategy uh, with a lot of M&A in the past uh, couple of years. So the main uh, item in the balance sheet is an intangible asset made of goodwill, uh, almost 1 billion uh, sec, which is amortized over uh, 10 years. Uh, but also we start seeing the more and more uh, investment in games uh, at the end of March, end of the first quarter, the total was 214 million sec. Uh, just for the quarter, uh, we have invested over 49 million sec in uh, games. Another important uh, item was, of course, the financial debt. We um, uh, secured a financing at the, end, at the beginning of February. And I can explain why our uh, financial debt increased to 204 million sec net of cash. Uh, and that will be used to uh, fund our games. The cash decreased also in uh, Q1, but it's also for seasonality reason. The working capital is usually increasing during that quarter. And this year was no different. We will see a different trend for the rest of the year. Usually, uh, working capital is uh, fairly stable year on year. I think that was the main uh, takeaways from uh, the financial uh, performance of the quarter. Back to Christina. Thank you, Thierry. So key takeaways and what we should remember from this quarter is Maximum Entertainment is launched and is here. And we had a, a huge success with Small Land, even though there was only three days of revenue that's reflected in Q1. We will see more uh, results of Small Land as we head into the rest of 2023. Um, and that will contribute to our stated strategic goal of 30% of our revenue coming from our own IP by 2025, and thereby increasing that gross margin percentage year over year. Um, live service continues to grow. Hopefully by Q2, we'll be able to announce 10 million players for Super Animal Royale. And, uh, and then the key takeaway was we had kind of a break-even soft EBITDA due to timing of our new releases and also a soft first quarter. After the quarter, one last note that you should remember is that we launched Bramble the Mountain King, and we're super excited about this game. It is uh, homegrown right here in Sweden, and it has a lot of Nordic folklore, and it's uh, launched after the quarter. We'll talk more about that in the Q2 report, but to a resounding success, both commercially and critically. 97% overwhelmingly positive on Steam, which is the first for not just uh, any, for any of the publishing entities uh, life to date in the history of our business. So we're super excited and proud about Bramble the Mountain King. Thank you for having me. And I think we're gonna talk a little bit uh, with Mike about some questions. Thank you very much, Christina and Thierry. So quite the journey from Sordix to Maximum Entertainment. Uh, could you t talk, talk to us a little bit about this name change and the history behind it? Sort of, uh, sort of uh, how do you say it, elaborate on that? Sure. Um, so Zordix was really reflective of the studio and uh, very particular to what they had created. And as the company really transformed through multiple acquisitions, as I mentioned, heading into 2021, it was an entirely different company ending 2022. And we wanted to reflect that. We wanted to tell the world we're a new company, we have new uh, things that we want to talk about and games that we want to create. And we wanted to reflect that with a name that was a little broader and covered all that we do, which is really entertainment, um, not just video games, but expanding the world of video games through transmedia. We sell vinyl, we sell soundtracks, and we sell collector's editions. And so we really are expanding the world. We wanted our name to reflect that. Hmm. Well, there, in, in the future, uh, since you mentioned uh, the entertainment sort of meaning behind the name, uh, w w do you see a possibility of expanding perhaps beyond video games? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to see what's happening in the industry today, right? You see uh, TV shows becoming video games, you see video games becoming movies, you see uh, soundtracks being 
being performed by huge orchestras because the quality of entertainment is so amazing within this industry. And so right now we're really focused on building up our IP so that we have those choices and that we have the opportunity to expand mm -hmm. with content that we're creating and building. So yes, we hope to be able to expand into all of those channels in the future. Exciting. Uh, also exciting is Bramble, of course, and we'll hear more about that in Q2. Uh, but let's talk about what you released here in Q1 then, Small Land. We heard you talk a little bit about it. And so far, 3,000 interviews, 85% of which are positive. Uh, how did it turn out? Uh, well, how did, it, how did it develop compared to your expectations? So far exceeded our expectations. When you, when you look at and putting a game into early access, you are really hoping that the players and that the gamers are going to help inform what we do in order to get to a 1.0 release. Mm. And so really you're not expecting it to be as gigantic as it was for Small Land. And it just goes to show that people are really excited about this IP. They're really enjoying the content. They're playing it for hours. They're streaming it for hours. And so we're learning a lot from the players, which is our whole goal with Early Access, is to learn exactly what they're doing, what they're playing, what they like. And so we're listening to that community. And actually, as a result of the commercial success and the reviews that we got, which were all very, very positive, um, we have kind of doubled down on our development efforts of this game. And so you're going to see a lot more content be released for Small Land over the course of 2023. Some would call the uh, co-op survival sort of genre as diluted, especially after the success story that was Minecraft, of course. Yeah. Uh, but, but could you walk us through some of the USP, unique selling points of Small Land? What are they? So I don't think it's diluted, although I think that there's an argument to be made for that, <laughs> for sure. But my own, my own uh, thought is just that it has a lot of market demand. Um, clearly, people love this genre, and although there are other games in this genre, um, there's still a lot of players who really enjoy it. And so, uh, so we believe that we have a place, and that Small Land is unique enough to stand on its own within a genre that is somewhat crowded. Except there's a lot of people who are still playing. We ha I, we have many many hours of gameplay for each of our gamers of Small Land, and so the um, you know what makes Small Land unique is really just the amazing environments and beauty that you can explore. And it's an open world game, you can get everywhere. You can fly on the back of a dragonfly. So it's super fun and uh, and gamers are really responding well. Mm. Important for early access games is of course that they'll evolve. Yes. Uh, what is the current uh, roadmap for the game? Yeah, actually we have a lot of information about the future looking roadmap for Small Land on the Steam page. So I encourage everybody to go check that out so that you can see what the future roadmap is going to look like um, but we have a lot of content planned and even more than we originally planned because like I said we're um, continuing to really invest in more content and more development of small land perhaps we'll be able to fly on a bee soon <laughs> maybe we'll see uh, set to release also is maximum football that you acquired the rights from in 2021 mm -hmm. it'll be released sometime in 2023 as a free to play uh, could you tell us more about the business model that is constructed around it yeah, we, um, we spent a lot of time figuring out what should we do with this content. Should we release it as a premium game? Should we release it as a, as a live service game? Should we release it as a free-to-play game? There's lots of different monetization choices now in, in games and when you're an, launching content. And as we were looking at it, we wanted to get the most people playing possible so that we could really show this, this really creative customizable alternative in a physics-based American football sim game. And so we believe that free-to-play was the right answer to be able to get a lot of players in and checking out the game that we're building. And the monetization strategy around it is really going to be uh, related to what are the key features of this game, which is customization. Hmm. So. Um, Normally when you're in an American football game or in many sports games, there's not a lot of customization because maybe they're licensed and they have limitations of what they can do. Our game is not that way. It's full customization. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the choices around monetization are gonna have to do with that customization capability. It is not gonna be a pay to win scenario. Nothing in our monetization strategy has anything to do with actual gameplay 
of making you better or not in the game. It's all around customization. Mm. I'm just going to go on a hunch here. I'm, I don't know much about American football, but yeah. would, there be, would it be, for example, cosmetics and perhaps creating your own team, sort of? Exactly, mm. exactly. You're going to be able to create your own, you know, if you wanted to create a whole American football team that had the colors of the Swedish flag and, um, and you know, something particular as a logo, you could do all of that for your own team. Mm. And so all of the, the monetization is going to be around the flexibility of customizing your team. Mm. Uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, and I'm curious about your goal for 2025. Uh, you're currently aiming for 30% of your revenue to be sourced by your own IPs. Where are you currently? So we're only at 7% currently, and last year we were less than 5%. And so the reason why we're making that statement and that stake in the ground is because of all the things that we've already talked about today, which is control over your IP so that you can expand that IP beyond the world of video games. That's really important. You have to own the IP in order to do that. The other thing is the margin that we talked about. It's 29% now, and that's up over previous quarter and previous year, and that is going to continue to be a KPI that we're tracking because having your own IP, you have the ability to generate more margin mm. with that. And so that's why we um, are heading in this direction, and that's really our story moving forward. Mm. And, um, and the reason why it's 30% versus 50 or 25 is because we wanted to set a goal that we felt like we had the team internally to achieve. And also, we have really great revenue outside of our own IP as well. Uh, and so that's through our publishing and, and sub-publishing business that we have around the world. And so we are really dedicated to that business as well. And so we're still going to have 70% revenue come from publishing you know, IP that isn't necessarily ours, but the 30% of our own helps us control our destiny a little bit more and then experience margin expansion. As we heard in the presentation on the beginning of this Q&A, the story of Sordix and Maximum Entertainment is a story of acquisitions. Uh, is acquisition part of this plan? Yeah, absolutely. But it'll be slightly different in the acquisition story moving forward, which is we'll be focused on our own IP, um, potentially more studios to create games that the that the publishing labels can exist. We have a really strong revenue infrastructure. And so, um, so when we're looking at acquisition, we're not looking for like more necessarily more um, publishers because we, we have that capability in house now. Really it's more content and IP that we can push through the engine and the infrastructure we already have. What about organic growth in your IPs? Yeah, the 30% is based on our organic growth of what we have. Mm in the barn today. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, we're hoping. Talk to us a little bit more. I, th I know that you mentioned margins before, but is there any other pros uh, to having uh, more revenue sourced in your IPs rather than third-party uh, publishing? What are some of the cons of that? And yeah. uh, why is 30% the magic number? So I'm not sure that 30% is like perfectly the magic number. It's just what we feel like is the right mix for us at this time. There's a ton of very successful video game companies on either side of that number. That's just kind of our number where we felt like we had the right infrastructure to support it. Um, the, the upside of 70% of your revenue coming from third party is that you get to take advantage of trends in the industry that you wouldn't necessarily be able to take advantage of if you were developing your own game. Games take a long time to develop. And so you don't know what's going to be successful 24, 36 months from now. Mm. Um, and so you're making some bets on your own IP that you believe that these are going to have strong market demand and lots of gamers are going to want to play that in 24 to 36 months. Um, but then there's also the, our, our model and our structure allows us to take third party titles that are trending or that there's market demand for and that they're really interesting games, we can add that to our company and really get a great result for those games as well. So that's why we like the split because we have the, the uh, you know, the own IP and the, the value creation of our own studio IP, but then also the infrastructure that allows us to create a lot of value for other people's IP as well and we can create margin with that. Christina Seely, CEO, and uh, Tihari uh, Bonoy, uh, CFO. Thank you very much for your presentation and your answers. Thank you. Thank you.